But what are what are like the best things that people can do to hedge their bets on on knee injury and help reduce that risk off the mats? So two things, like I said, positional awareness, positional situation awareness, and then training the actual knee joint itself. So positional awareness is understanding where knee injuries are supposed to happen more than just, oh, takedowns, I should avoid takedowns. You should look, you should know what takedowns are more at risk. You know, obviously there's like high risk techniques like jumping guards, a high risk technique of injuring your training partner, the kanabasami, the, the scissor takedown, you know, any type of takedown where there's falling body weight, they're all high risk. So that's like a big thing from a teacher perspective of things I kind of talk about. Um, another big thing is like how you defend. Like sometimes people are a little bit too willing, like they're not willing to concede the takedown even in training and then they get injured in that sense. Um, so like those are the type of things of knowing where and when these injuries happen. So that being said, that's going to be probably your best way to prevent injury. But now we can talk about injury mitigation. So you take the knee joint itself, right? So the knee has two degrees of freedom it means it bends and it straightens, but it also rotates. Now I'm actually writing a paper on this, but like connective tissue responds to stress. And this is more seen in obviously the rehabilitation standpoint where people have a ligament or connective tissue injury. Well, you, you know, the, these ligament injuries, um, as your body heals, just because it doesn't hurt, doesn't mean that the knee is healed. It just means that it doesn't hurt. Um, healing ligament tissue is still fundamentally weak. So essentially scar tissue is weaker. It's more lax. It's easier to break. How do you get the ligament to regain the resilience it had pre-injury? It's appropriate loading. So for me, in addition to doing like strength training, which can or can't help when you to think that strength training specifically will reduce overuse injuries. But having like a strong quad or strong hamstring isn't necessarily going to make a significant difference because you have to think if you have a maximal strength contraction that can take, I don't know, 200 milliseconds, but most sporting injuries happen in like 30, 40 milliseconds. It doesn't matter how strong you are because you can't contract the muscle enough to resist the force. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's basically like a, I, I, an example would be, let's you got someone, they can, they have no problem squatting 225 yeah. pounds. They can control it. They can yeah. do uh, squats, do a box and stand up powerfully. Yeah. But the time it takes for that knee to go through the full range of flexion and extension to perform the exercise when they're live training, it's so fast that the actual quad muscle and the hamstrings and supporting muscles yeah. can't fire to prevent flexion or extension or mitigate rotation and so that's what's causing the injury correct yeah exactly so and this this is to to build on that i mean it's people that i'm thinking of in my head it, yeah. a lot of it's like i don't understand I, I you know i'm strength training so frequently and i know that i'm quote strong i can't yeah. believe it happened yeah it's so like yeah i mean like i mean if if the just gets like you know can't get wrong strong motto worked then strong people wouldn't get injured that obviously right. it's not the case right you look at gordon ryan he's pretty jacked he tore his lcl you take you know andre govau he went into adcc with the torn acl so these are strong dudes so it's not like just yeah. get stronger is necessarily <laughs> enough you can strengthen connective tissue so generally what i do and this is never done is and this is a concept i got from functional range systems but when i include knee training is I want to train knee rotation. So that's a thing that almost is never trained because huh. generally when people are doing is they're just doing bilateral sagittal plane movements, but injuries don't happen in the sagittal plane for grappling. They're going to happen in the frontal plane with the knee doesn't bend or rotation. So these are ways that I know that if I do like I end range isometrics, I can start to initiate the strengthening process for ligament and connective tissue. Now, now the big thing is how does this actually transfer to a, you know, injury reduction risk that that research doesn't exist. But if I can train active range of motion in rotation, well, obviously, as my knees moving in the frontal plane before it moves in the frontal plane, it's going to rotate. So if I have more rotational capacity, that gives me maybe a slight buffer of maybe I can move or etc. Two by training that, so that does rotational this, capacity, uh, I'm, I'm loading the, the. Say that again. Uh, so does this 
contradict the mobile stable joint by joint theory, the Greg Cook theory, where like your ankle is a mobile joint, your knee is stable, your hip is mobile. And it, I think about that and I think about the flexion and extension in the knee joint. When we're having a tough time, I can picture rotation in that like if I plant my foot, right, hmm. and I create like torque, I can kind of see in my head that like the knee, the patella might start to rotate even though the ankle is fixed. Yeah. And an extreme version of that would be bad, right? We see that and someone's got someone's ankle and they try to rotate out of it. The ankle stays, the knee r- r- rotates past its capacity and yeah. then does that. So yeah. when you're training, maybe you can explain a little bit more how to train rotation in your knee. So generally if I'm training, I always initiate rotational training um, in like a sitting position. So I can use something called a controlled articular rotation. When I do my asymmetric training, I'll do it. Generally, I want the knee bent to about 90 degrees because that's where you have the most rotational capacity. Generally, as you go into, as you start to get more straightening, you lose rotational movement. So what's happening is especially around 10 or 15 degrees of knee extension. Now what's happening is the the knee, the tibia is gonna externally rotate into the femur. It's called the screw home mechanism. So that's when the knee is fully locked, you can no longer rotate it. So if you ever watch people do a heel hook, you need some slight knee bend because the knee has the least rotational capacity about 10 or 15 degrees, which generally is where most sporting injuries also occur is that 10 or 15 degrees. And this uh, is not coming from the femur. I'm I'm sitting here in my chair right now, and I'm yeah. trying to like my meet my knees at ninety degrees, and I'm trying to rotate. But I feel like all of that rotation, it feels like it's just coming from my femur. Is it not? No, it should. So what what you want to do? What you can do That's right now, and anyone who wants is I want you to to so you're sitting at ninety degrees. I want you to kind of like Dorsey flex your ankle, so you lift your ankle, but push your heel in the ground. Yep. And if you feel like you can't do it without doing it, you even can put your hands between your legs so your femur doesn't move. All I want you to do is just try to rotate your shin away from you, and then you can rotate back. Oh, wow. Gotcha. Yeah. So uh, for those listening, the femur is locked down yeah. because I put my hands in between my legs, like you said. Yeah. So there's no shift. And then um, dorsiflex, my toes come off the ground, drive the heel into the ground and rotate. Yeah. And that's coming from the knee joint via the tibia and fibula. Yeah. So fibula. and so, so I gave you what's called uh, passive blocking, meaning you don't have the motor control awareness to dissociate your, your knee. So you're compensating either by moving your hip or compensating by moving your ankle. So when I put you in those positions where your ankle and your hip can't move, the only thing that can move is your knee. So generally, if I'm working with a client, right. I start with these motor control exercise to like learn how to rotate because most people I say rotate your knee you're gonna be like what the hell are you talking about the knee doesn't rotate so it's exactly how I just felt (laughs) yeah so so once I (laughs) once I teach someone how to rotate then I would do like an end range isometric whether it's an external or internal range of motion so I like using long length isometrics specifically so what you could do is you could externally rotate your your tibia on your femur and then what I would do is I would do essentially almost like I'm trying to heel hook myself where I would try to internally rotate from that lengthened position. Yeah. And then by isometrics, that allows me to subjectively ramp up the intensity. So early on, if somebody has poor awareness, they've never trained this or they're coming back from an injury, I keep the subjective isometric intensity very low because gotcha. the knee joint has never been trained. It doesn't know how to do this. Maybe there's an injury. As we get out of the rehab phase and we're in more of the strength and conditioning phase, we want to really ramp up that intensity anywhere from that 60 to 80% max contraction. Because I mean, if you look, if you look, if you look at the literature, pretty much for training, like we really need to ramp the intensity. So I can do like an 80% isometric ramping to get a, physiological adaptation in the knee but right. the, the intensity has to be there 